the father of modern occultism, Alephus Levi. Alephus Levi, born February 8, 1810, in Paris, France, as Alphonse Louis Constant. Little is known of his childhood, but his father, a shoemaker and a craftsman. Constant was referred to as the clever lad. His parish priest singled Constant out as a boy of promise and enrolled him in a school that he had set up. At the age of 15, Constant went on to the little seminary of St. Nicolas de Chardonnay, where he fell under the influence of Abbe Ferrer Colonna, a man whom he called later the most intelligent and sincerely pious priest I have ever known. Then the priest of his parish obtained a free education for him at the seminary of St. Sulpice. He studied Latin and Greek, but never formally studied Hebrew, which shows in his frequent mistakes in his interpretation of the Kabbalah. He desired to be a priest. He did become a deacon, but in 1836, before his priesthood, he had to leave the seminary due to a love affair, many say. Some even say his mother's suicide is due to this. For several years after this, he socialized with a circle made of young bohemians, a heterogeneous group of artists and socialists. His attempt to return to clerical life in 1839 by joining a Dominican monastery did not work out due to a conflict of interest, and he was desperately looking for a new perspective. He felt hope when he was offered a position at Julie as a supervisor. During this time, he wrote the Bible of Liberty, which was published on February 13, 1841. It was confiscated within an hour of its publication, but only after numerous copies were successfully distributed. He was arrested in April 1841 and convicted to eight months in prison and a 300 franc fine. On May 11th, after showing no remorse, the trial made him instantly famous in and outside of the country. The Bible of Liberty was the first of many publications with which Constant distinguished himself in the 1840s as one of the most sensational representatives of the Christian revolutionary socialism. His role model was the priest Felicity de Lemonais, the founder of the so-called Neo-Catholicism. The young and enthusiastic Neo-Catholics wanted to reconcile Catholicism with post-revolutionary society by establishing a liberal, progressive, and social Catholicism that sought to actively engage with contemporary philosophical, political, and scientific discourses. The Neo-Catholics achieved a public breakthrough in 1830 with their journal Le Avenir. However, the movement was swiftly and violently crushed soon after. His personal life had its disappointments too. He seduced Eugenie, assi assistant headmistress, who bore him an illegitimate child. This was the one time in his life which was usually devoted to social utopianism and mystical absorption when Constant committed a misdeed, abandoned the teacher, and became infatuated with her student, Naomi Cadiot. In 1846, at the age of 36, Constant married the 17-year-old girl. She had shown up at his apartment one day to stay. Constant didn't ask her to leave, and Naomi's father demanded a marriage. It was a disastrous marriage. They had a daughter who died in childhood, and soon after, Naomi left him. But the radical tracks continued to appear, stimulated by the revolution of 1848. Because of the publication of a violently revolutionary pamphlet, La Voix de, de la Famine, he was again imprisoned in 1847. After the February Revolution, he presided over the Club de la Montan, which was described by contemporaries as one of the most radical clubs. At that time, Constant published his Testament de, Liber de Liberté in 1848, which has later been misunderstood as re representing the end of his political ambitions, but was in fact a euphoric writing about the beginning of a new regenerated world and the emancipation of the people. Paris at this time had a cholera outbreak that took more than 19,000 lives. Along with this, it was filthy and an overcrowded city. The failure of his marriage 
and the recent revolution left Constant depressed and digging deeper into occultism, and in 1851 he collaborated on the Dictionary of Christian Literature. It was to be his truly last orthodox work, religious, political, or esoteric, for the direction of his life was changed dramatically by two quite unrelated events. In 1852, he met Hone Ronsky, a metaphysician and an eccentric who inspired him greatly. The effect of Ronsky's influence was to reconcile a number of opposing elements in Constance thinking. Up till then, the staunch Christian in him had conflicted with the socialist, the rationalist, and with the mystic. Constant had contributed to the leftist paper, The Review Progressive, owned by the Marquise de Montefiorier, and his wife, Naomi, soon became Marquise's mistress, immersed in his Kabbalistic studies. Constant did not notice what was going on until it was too late. To escape the pain of his betrayal, he immersed himself in his writing, and in due course, the dogma appeared. It was the first use of the name he would be known as for the rest of his life, Eliphas Levi, and the first appearance of the widely used Baphomet that we continue to see to this day. Some scholars interpret these events as the point when Abbey Constant died to be succeeded by this new identity. His most famous books, Dogma and Ritual of High Magic, 1854 to 1856, History of Magic, 1860, and The Key of Mysteries, 1861, are considered to be the founding works of occultism. These three works contain the most original and influential ideas, the application of the Hebrew alphabet to the tarot trumps, and their placing on the Kabbalistic tree of life, the doctrine of astral light, and the effective revival of Christian Kabbalah. They also contain a host of maddening contradictions, the result of Levi's attempt to balance his occult philosophy with his continuing devotion to the Catholic Church. In 1855, he founded in collaboration with Charles Faverty and Charles Le Mornier a monthly journal called Le Revue Phallicique et Religieuse, to which he contributed poetry and articles on the Kabbalah. This period lasted only three years, but it helped to spread his reputation reputation together with his first books. The late 1850s were a happy time for Levi. He was well established as an occultist, basked in the affection and esteem of a lively circle of friends. He could be seen in, at gatherings all over Paris. He also visited England several times. On his first visit, he met a mysterious woman in London and performed a ritual that took three weeks of preparation to invoke the spirit of Apollonius of Tyana an ancient philosopher and magician, and his account reads like a work of fiction. The preliminaries terminated on the 2nd of July. It was proposed to evoke the phantom of the divine Apollonius and interrogate it upon two secrets, one concerned myself and one which interested the lady. She had counted on taking part in the evocation with a trustworthy person, who, however, proved nervous at the last moment and as the triad or unity is indispensable for magical rites, I was left to my own resource. The cabinet prepared for the evocation was situated in a turret. It contained four concave mirrors and a species of altar having a white marble top, encircled by a chain of magnetized iron. The sign of the pentagram, as given in the fifth chapter of this work, was graven and gilded on the white marble surface. It was inscribed also in various colors upon a new white lambskin stretched beneath the altar. In the middle of the marble table, there was a small copper chafing dish containing charcoal of alder and laurel wood. Another chafing dish was set before me on a tripod. I was clothed in a white garment, very similar to the alb of our Catholic priests, but longer and wider and I wore upon my head a crown of vervain leaves, intertwined with a gold chain. I held a new sword in one hand, and in the other the ritual. I kindled two fires with the requisite prepared substances, 
and began reading the evocations of the ritual, in a voice at first low, but rising by degrees. The smoke spread, the flame caused the objects upon which it fell to waver, then it went out, the smoke still floating white and slow about the marble altar. I seemed to feel a quaking of the earth, my ears tingled, my heart beat quickly. I heaped more twigs and perfumes on the chafing dishes, as the flame again burst up, I held distinctly before the altar the figure of a man of more than normal size, which dissolved and vanished away. I recommenced the evocations and placed myself within a circle which I had drawn previously between the tripod and the altar. Thereupon the mirror which was behind the altar seemed to brighten in its depth. A wan form was outlined therein, which increased and seemed to approach by degrees. Three times, and with closed eyes, I invoked Apollonius. When I again looked forth, there was a man in front of me, wrapped from head to foot in a species of shroud, which seemed more gray than white. He was lean, melancholy, and beardless. It did not altogether correspond to the preconceived notion of, of Apollonius. I experienced an abnormally cold sensation, and when I endeavored to question the phantom, I could not articulate a syllable. I therefore placed my hand upon the sign of the pentagram and pointed the sword at the figure, commanding it mentally to obey and not alarm me. In virtue of the said sign, the form thereupon became vague and suddenly disappeared. I directed it to return and presently felt, as it were, a breath close by me. So something touched my hand, which was holding the sword, and my arm became immediately benumbed as far as the elbow. I divined that the sword displeased the spirit, and I therefore placed it point downwards, close by me within the circle. The human figure reappeared immediately, but I experienced such an intense weakness in all my limbs, and a swooning sensation came so quickly over me that I made two steps to sit down, whereupon I fell into a profound lethargy, accompanied by dreams of which I had only a confused recollection when I came again to myself. For several subsequent days, my arm remained benumbed and painful. That the apparition did not speak to me, but it seemed that the questions I had designed to ask answered themselves in my mind. To that of the lady, an interior voice replied, Death. It was concerning a man about whom she desired information. As for myself... I sought to know whether reconciliation and forgiveness were possible between two persons whom occupied my thoughts, and the same exorbable echo within gave me an answer. Dead. In 1861 he became a Freemason, but left the society in later years due to his beliefs that they had strayed from their original purpose. Levi's fame as a master of the occult mysteries brought him a number of eager supportive students, one of them Miss Hutchinson wife of the English consul in Paris, who wrote, Eliphas Levi is the only man I have known to have arrived in a state of profound peace. His good humor was indestructible, his gaiety and liveliness inexhaustible, his brilliant rebellion wit, profound for those who understood the philosophical sense of his words, was equally pleasing to humbler people who only detect amusing jokes in them and succumb to the charm of this amiable man. Whatever were the faculties of the soul who appreciate his soul, he put himself within their reach, while at the same time elevating them as much as possible without deceiving himself as to the degree to which they could attain. Talking much without ever venturing into discreet word, he displayed at the same time a complete frankness and extreme reserve. His consciousness was a priestly sanctuary. In one of his letters to his student, Baron, Levi outlined the rules of which he lived during these years. He said, I seek to maintain a great calmness of mind and cleanliness of body, a well-ventilated and dry apartment of even temperature, yet more cold than warm, an apartment with nothing out of place and in which nothing calls to mind the grosser needs of life. I would be as embarrassed at once finding a wash basin in view as I would be if I went out into the street without my breeches on. I eat more moderate meals, which satisfy my appetite without exciting it. 
My food is simple and substantial. I leave my work before I am overly tired. I take moderate healthy exercise. I take particular care never to become overexcited or too fatigued in the evening so that the greatest calm may precede sleep. Living in this way, one can become aware of any nascent malady, which it can be still treated with the idlest remedies. Patience and good humor will do the rest. Everyone is good to me. When I pass by, children smile at me. My little cell never sees any but the kindest faces. Everything breathes an atmosphere of deep peace. The earth would be an Eden for me if my brothers were not suffering in it. By 1861, Levi had in entered upon the final teaching phase of his life. He was known and respected as an occultist and magician, both in France and England, and he began to acquire disciples in both countries. Among them was Kenneth Mackenzie, Frederick Hickley in England, and Baron Constantine Bernicke, Jean-Baptiste Patois, Jacques Charot, and the Theosophist Mary Jebbard. To all of these he gave instruction freely, describing his method in a letter to Baron. As regards our lessons, I have no manuscript course. I give to my disciples according to the need of their minds and what spirit gives me for them. I demand nothing and I refuse nothing for them in return. It is communion and an exchange of bread, spiritual for bodily. But the needs of the body are of so little account for me that the generous gifts of those of my children and bro brothers who are rich serve mainly to satisfy the first and greatest need of my soul and of all of our souls, charity. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and the humiliating defeat of France were a horrible blow to Eliphas Levi because he saw France as the future savior of civilization. At the end of the war, Levi had no resources and was saved from starvation by Mary Jebbard, who invited him to stay at her home in Germany where he remained for about two months in the summer of 1871. Levi's periods of illness were becoming increasingly frequent, but between he continued to maintain contact with his followers and to write. He was grateful for the continued devotion of his close disciples. He also received accolades for, from the literary world. As the year 1875 wore on, his condition became steadily worse. Dropsy had also developed, and gangrene had begun, begun to attack his feet. Levi faced his last agonizing days with courage and preserved his mental facilities until the last moment. His friends were constantly with him. He passed away on May 31st, and the funeral was held two days later. The year of his death was predicted for him, though. A curious character named Giuliano Capella he met only once told him that his life was regulated by the inexorable law of numbers, and that he was a man of the pentagram, that the years marked by the number five were always fateful ones, and for him, that meant he would pass in 1875. His teachings went on to inspire groups such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, H.P. Bulavatsky, and Theosophy, and even Aleister Crowley claimed to be Elephas reincarnated. He also had an impact on the spiritualism movement, though in regard to the purported supernatural occurrences reported by the practitioners of spiritualism, Levi was credulous. He explained the phenomenon which quite recently have perturbed America and Europe, those of table-turning fluidic manifestations are simply magnetic currents at the beginning of their formation, appeals on the part of nature inviting us for the good of humanity and to reconstitute great sympathetic and religious chains. He professed himself to be a poor and obscure scholar who has found the lever of Achaemenes, and he offers it to you for the good of humanity alone and asks nothing whatsoever in exchange. And this is the story of Elephas Levi, who without his inspiration in writings, occultism, and even culture today, would be quite different. Thank you for watching today's video, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what topic you would like me to do next, and it may be my next video.